Let me see. My guest is David Vine, PhD, professor of anthropology at American University. He is author of two excellent books, which I have read. One is Base Nation, and the other is The United States of War. Uh, David, I wanted to ask you uh, your perspective about what's going on in Gaza. First, Hart, th thank you for having me. It's really a pleasure to get to meet you and speak with you. What is going on in Gaza? Uh, it's a big question, I know, but I wanted to leave it open-ended just to get your perspective. Uh, horror is going on in Gaza. A genocide is going on in Gaza. It seems very clear to me and has seemed clear to me for many, many months, given the things that the Israeli government and Israeli government officials have said and done. And I think it's important to point out that this is very much a U.S.-backed genocide. Uh, the United States government has been deeply involved in supporting the Israeli government from the beginning, uh, beginning with the arms that the U.S. government supplies or allows the Israeli government to buy. And it has continued to do that uh, despite some rhetorical shifts and allusions to putting pressure on the Israeli government. But uh, the Israeli government, beginning with Prime Minister Netanyahu, appears very set on continuing this war. And Netanyahu in particular, of course, wants to continue the war because it is protecting his political life uh, and keeping him in office. And it seems quite frighteningly that Netanyahu and others in the Israeli government want to expand the war to become a larger regional war involving uh, attacks on Iran and Hezbollah and others, uh, a war that could be even more catastrophic than the unbelievably catastrophic horror that is the Israeli genocidal war in Gaza. What would you say to somebody who says Israel has a right to defend itself? I would say many things. I would say that this war that the Israeli government has pursued since October 7th has not been about defending itself. It has been uh, a very poor form of defense. It has been about many things other than defense. So the Israeli government could, of course, defend the border between Israel and Gaza and protect Israeli citizens, people in Israel, uh, quite successfully, and could have, of course, protected that border in the days and weeks and months before October 7th. Uh, this war is about, again, many things other than defense. It's about uh, Netanyahu trying to, again, save his political life after being the primary person responsible for allowing the attacks and atrocities of October 7th to happen. It's about uh, showing the Israeli public and neighboring governments and publics, as well as the world, uh, kind of strength that Netanyahu and others in Israel want to uh, portray after being shown to be far weaker than many people thought. It's, of course, also uh, only a, a good way of ensuring that cycles of violence continue on into the future, which is not a very good way of defending Israel or the Israeli people. It's ensuring that more are radicalized and want to take up arms against Israel. And it's hard to really argue or uh, fail to understand why someone in Gaza wouldn't want to take up arms against Israel, given the horror being inflicted on the people of Gaza. Uh, just un unbelievable levels of killing where words really can't capture the, the horror that has been uh, inflicted on the entire population of Gaza, uh, and where, where there really is no military need for, for any of this. This is about revenge and uh, some powerful peoples uh, protecting their 
political lives and others profiting off the horror in Gaza. Of course, the, the arms manufacturers in the United States and in Israel, as among others, have been making a, a killing off the genocide in Gaza. Uh, they have seen stock prices and sales skyrocket as the, the war has continued. And they are, um, you know, laughing all the way to the bank as the people in Gaza experience a kind of suffering that I think none of us not living in Gaza can even begin to comprehend. So you're an anthropologist and not merely a historian. So you have kind of a understanding of human societies. Why would you say this is happening? If the Let's say for the sake of discussion that the majority of Americans are against this. They're at least against paying for it. They're majority of Democrats are against it. Most of the world is against it. If so many people in the world and in the United States are against this, why does it happen? I think it happens because there are some very powerful people, very powerful corporations, and very powerful structures, entire political economic structures, namely the military industrial complex uh, that are profiting and benefiting from the genocidal war in Gaza. The Israeli, the pro-Israeli government lobby in the United States and, and globally is incredibly powerful in supporting the Israeli government and anything it seems to want to do. Uh, and meanwhile, and, and thus politicians are among those benefiting in the form of campaign donations and uh, again, also protecting their political futures because we've seen what APAC, the, the uh, American-Israeli uh, relations, uh, uh, political action committee, sorry, the Israeli, the American-Israeli political action committee, it's a, an organization I uh, am not, uh, definitely not a member of, um, hence the, the fumble, but um, it and other parts of the, the pro-Israeli government lobby have shown what they will do if a politician opposes uh, really um, full-fledged support for Israel that 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 uh, the Israeli government demands. Um, they have shown that they will take on, for example, Cori Bush, who lost lost her primary race uh, just recently. Um, and meanwhile, they're not the only ones benefiting from from uh, the genocide in Gaza. The, again, the military industrial complex, the weapons manufacturers, the war profiteers are also benefiting from uh, the status quo of, of um, unbridled US support for uh, the Israeli government that we've seen really for, for decades. And it's only in recent months, in some ways in, in recent years, but, but certainly to, to new levels after October 7th, that we've seen a beginning the beginnings of a, a shift in in public support for for Palestinians and uh, the beginnings of a, a shift among really just uh, politicians in the Democratic Party uh, who have uh, begun to express opposition to the us backed genocide and for uh, the kind of uh, unquestioned support that, uh, the United States government has provided for Israel for decades. I wanted to ask you about the military industrial complex. Um, they're an especially powerful lobby. How does that work? Can you give us a sense of the, the extent of it? Uh, it? It doesn't seem to be something that is very well covered in the media. So it's kind of there, but it's not there. It's true. The, this entity, the military industrial complex that President Eisenhower, of course, warned us about as he was leaving office in 1961, uh, the military industrial complex uh, has gotten very little attention. If anything, people think of it as maybe something of a conspiracy theory or mm -hmm. um, something not to be believed. Uh, but meanwhile, it has been this incredibly powerful political and economic force and structure that has shaped 
and damaged all of our lives here in the United States and millions upon millions of lives uh, around the world. Uh, the military industrial complex today is, has grown in power and size far beyond Eisenhower's worst nightmares. And if one wants to understand why the United States has been in a long series of, of endless wars, looked to the endless wars since uh, 2001 and the Bush administration's invasion and war in Afghanistan, as well as the long series of wars since World War II, we have to ask who, who's been benefiting from these wars? Because again, someone and some corporations in particular have been benefiting, beginning with the arms manufacturers that are at the, the heart of the military industrial complex, this complex of the arms manufacturers, war profiteers, combined with corrupt members of Congress and corrupt high-level military officials, military personnel who benefit from the system, uh, in addition to many others, including parts of academia, Hollywood, the media, uh, the intelligence complex, and, and far beyond, they have benefited first and foremost in the form of an annual military budget, which I rightly understood as an annual war budget, that now is around $1.5 trillion, $1.5 trillion, that's trillion with a T, including all the elements of, of military and war spending. Uh, most people in the United States have no clue how much money, how much of their taxpayer dollars are being plowed into this war machine. And that has been a war machine that was firmly established during World War II. It grew in power to the point that Eisenhower was warning us about the military industrial complex in the early days of the Cold War and has only continued to grow, where we have military budgets now that exceed the heights of the Cold War, where the threat of the Soviet Union was a far, 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 far greater threat than that posed by Russia or China or both. Uh, the threats posed by Russia and China have been greatly exaggerated, as the threat of the Soviet, Soviet Union was previously, but it's been exaggerated to justify uh, boosting U.S. military budgets to these unprecedented heights. Uh, that, this is what we need to take on. This is what we need to not just pay attention to, but take on directly and seek to dismantle. And that's why I've been working with a group of uh, people involved in think tanks and activist groups, academics, uh, veterans groups, and, and many others who have come to believe and come to see that the military industrial complex has been the elephant in the room that's been preventing us from making any progress in stopping US endless wars, in cutting the size of the Pentagon budget, and in changing US foreign policy, uh, shifting it away from a long standing policy of, of intervention and war and meddling in other countries to a, a foreign policy revolving around diplomacy and negotiation and peace building which is possible, um, but it's not going to be possible unless we take on the military industrial complex, which has deepened the commitment in the United States to a status quo that has ensured the United States has lurched from one endless war to the next with millions upon millions of people dying and suffering in the process. This reminds me of something that you may or may not have studied very much. You probably know a lot about it by comparison with the average citizen. Um, somehow Indonesia pops into my mind. Like in 1965, there was a U.S. orchestrated, um, whatever you want to call it, mass murder in Indonesia that's almost never discussed. I, I mean, I, I think the average American doesn't know about it because I didn't know about it prior to about five years ago. This, and it's illustrative of, it, it shows that it, that we're not the Boy Scouts of the world, that we're not the heroes. But anyway, I didn't want to editorialize too much. Tell us what happened in 1965 in Indonesia, and what would you like for Americans to know about that? I think the important, I'm, I'm not an expert on Indonesia either, but U.S. Uh, involvement in Indonesia backing 
right-wing forces in Indonesia against uh, insurgents and, and those that right-wing forces labeled uh, as communists and um, who needed to be eliminated and, and uh, were, were responsible for what many have described as a genocide in Indonesia in the 1960s. And um, certainly genocidal massacres uh, took place with the support of uh, the US government and, and other European uh, and allied governments. And I think what it points to is a, a longer pattern of, of not just endless wars, but endless violence that the United States government has supported in the form of coups and backing for often right-wing dictatorships, uh, the bloody genocidal, in at least the case of Guatemala, civil wars of the 1980s are another case in point where uh, the U.S. government backed right-wing dictatorships and right-wing forces in the case of Nicaragua. Uh, uh, in in wars that uh, did not need to be fought, of course, as um, no war needs to be fought, uh, or very few, uh, and took uh, hundreds of thousands of lives in the case of, of the wars in, in Central America. So there's a, a longer, broader pattern of violence that the U.S. government has, has supported in this foreign policy and mode of engaging with the rest of the world that has been dominated by U.S. military force and that has been so destructive, not just to places like Indonesia and Central America and Afghanistan, Iraq, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, um, but has ultimately been extraordinarily harmful to the vast majority of people in the United States. That's one of the problems with the military industrial complex. You could say, well, well, you know, the military industrial complex, military spending, it provides jobs. It, it does. Some benefit. The vast majority of the beneficiaries are a small group of corporate elites. And again, the corporate politicians, they bribe and prop mm -hmm. up uh, corrupt uh, U.S. military elites as well. Some people, of course, have jobs in the factories, but military spending is actually a really horrible form of economic development and job creation. You create far more jobs and research by the University of Massachusetts Amherst has shown that you create far more jobs if you invest a million dollars in healthcare or infrastructure or education than if you invest that same million dollars in, in military spending. Uh, so it's, it's really a small uh, corporate and political and military elite that has benefited from this commitment to endless war and to foreign policy dominated by really imperial expansion and, and uh, military force, uh, while the vast majority of people in the United States have seen their tax dollars plowed into this war system that has systematically prevented the U.S. government from investing in things like universal health care and mm -hmm. taking on global warming, climate change, global heating, uh, from providing uh, high quality education to every person in the United States among, and ensuring that no one sleeps on the street as they do down the block from where I live in California, among the many other problems that have been systematically neglected because tax dollars have been plowed into a war system and military industrial complex. Let's talk about the dollars. Now I have some rough calculations and I welcome you uh, modifying my understanding of this, but you know, as of a couple of years ago, there was $750 billion a year in the Pentagon budget. But then on top of that, you have to add, if you want to know the true cost of military, you have to add veterans affairs, which includes long-term healthcare costs of veterans. You have to add uh, nuclear, which is under the Department of Energy. You have to add the Department of Homeland Security. And that's why you said that the real cost is maybe double the Pentagon budget, 
And if you take that and divide it by 350 million Americans, uh, I, I forget what, it seemed to me like I came up with a figure of about $4,500 per American per year. And that's hard to believe because we're not seeing that. We don't talk about it. We're not seeing it. And then some of it is just like, it's not out of pocket so much as it is just added to the national debt. Plus there's a whole bunch of um, spending that is just not accounted for. Uh, so, but is it fair to say that if you take 4,500 and multiply it by four for a family of four, then you've got $18,000. Is it, is it out of line to say that the average, that a family of four pay on average pays $18,000 a year for, for war. <laughs> it is uh, something in that vicinity. Indeed. The, the numbers are so large. It is really difficult to wrap one's mind around. I mean, one or believe it when you hear it. Yeah. yeah one trillion dollars is, is hard to mm -hmm. virtually impossible to comprehend. Uh, ultimately, and, and the $1.5 trillion that several uh, sources have, have arrived at includes spending on, on the debt, spending on past. Oh, mm -hmm. Yeah, spending. yeah. Um, but indeed, you pointed to the other forms of military spending that are usually ignored. And, and basically, the uh, Congress and the U.S. government at large have found ways to hide the true level of military spending and the true level of theft, to use the word that President Eisenhower used in a 1953 speech mm, when yeah. he described military spending as a, as a theft, because he rightly pointed out it, every dollar spent on the military is a dollar not spent on children who are hungry and people who are going unclothed and people who aren't being educated. So I think uh, given the, the huge numbers, uh, it's important to, to think about again, where the money isn't being spent, who it's enriching, who's benefiting, and where it isn't being spent. Because I think if, if you ask most people in the United States, where would you like to see your tax dollars invested? Sure, most would say some should appropriately be invested in protecting the United States militarily, protecting the borders of the United States. But very few would want the money invested in, in wars, um, uh, wars of choice that the United States government has waged continually, continuously and, and endlessly. And, and most people would have no clue uh, what percentage of their, their tax bill goes to supporting this war system. I, I would po point people to the National Priorities Project, which is a, a great organization that tracks military and war spending, and you can see counters, meaning um, uh, tickers that show right. you on a continual basis how much is being spent on the military, how much, much is being spent on, the, for example, the post 9-11 wars, where the US taxpayers have spent something around $9 trillion on just the wars, and that's on top of the annual Pentagon budget and larger war budget. You can also see the trade-offs, what else we could have done, for example, with $9 trillion. That's, again, $9 trillion with a T. Right. Uh, as well as uh, they for the, the latest uh, Pentagon budget, you can see what it breaks down to per taxpayer, so the kind of calculation you've done. And I think that is helpful for bringing home just how messed up the country's priorities have been. And it's not, of course, because in some democratic fashion, all of us mm -hmm. people in the United States have agreed to spend our money this way, have agreed to wage catastrophic wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and far beyond. It's because the war system and the military has been controlled by a relatively small, corrupt group of corporations, war profiteers, corrupt politicians, and a small uh, elite of uh, ideas, people who produce supposed ideas about foreign policy, the, the blob that they're sometimes referred to as the foreign policy thinkers, although it's, it's really a form of group think that has led the United States to be so firmly entrenched uh, in this status quo that has uh, destroyed and taken the lives of 
really tens of millions while damaging the lives of hundreds of millions more. I'm tempted to ask you to give some sense of the the body counts. I've you know I've done some like the way I see it. If you look at Korea, three million in rough terms. If you look at Vietnam, three million, it, and uh, it, it, you've already got Holocaust. You know, just in in our lifetime or a little bit before I was born. But post World War Two, you've got the U.S. Empire being responsible for so many deaths, and this is another thing that's just not in our consciousness. We think, uh, you know, we see the flag, we uh, hear the national anthem, we have this mythology floating around in our minds about what it's all about. Yeah, no, that that's part a big part of the problem that people in the United States, myself included, from a very young age, are trained to see the United States as, as the good guy, the force for good and for spreading democracy and uh, for uh, protecting the world. And really those sorts of myths, those sorts of claims should be laughable um, if of course the consequences weren't so deadly. There's nothing oh, yeah. funny about it. Um, right. but, but part of the work that we need to do is is to puncture the the myths of, of the United States and to show a more complicated, uh, well-rounded picture of what the United States is, what it does in the world. And and again, that's, that's part of why I, I talk about the U.S. government. Uh, the the United States is a broad, complicated entity involving hundreds of millions of people and. Um, and, and, and in many configurations. And again, while we have some democratic rights, the, the, the war, the system and the endless wars the United States has been uh, involved in and leading for decades and that have killed the lives, taken the lives of millions upon millions of people. Uh, this is something that a very small group of people have committed the, the country to rather than the country as a whole choosing to uh, wage a catastrophic war in Vietnam or uh, wars throughout S Southeast Asia, wars in Central America, wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, far beyond now a genocidal war in, in Gaza. Um, and, and, and that's why part of the work to change the, the path of the United States will require us to puncture the kinds of myths that uh, that make people rally around the flag and rally around the idea of the U.S. military as a, a source of, of only good. Um, and it's important to point out that, that while I'm critical of the military-industrial complex, I, I see the vast majority of people in the U.S. military as being among yeah. the victims right. of the military-industrial complex itself. Uh, these are the people, the vast majority, being sent off to fight catastrophic wars that uh, do nothing other than to bring suffering to, to people in places like Afghanistan and, and Iraq, while also bringing suffering to U.S. military personnel and their mm -hmm. family members. Uh, the people, the vast majority of people in the U.S. military are among those who have suffered because the country uh, has been committed to this system of, of endless wars, uh, thanks to this corrupt military industrial complex and, and the people who have controlled it. Right. I, I'd like to get your uh, understanding of the war in Ukraine. It seems to me like we've been sold a story that says Russia is the aggressor and we're not allowed to talk about or think about anything that happened prior to 2022. But um, and it also seems to me that if we support the people of Ukraine, pouring weapons into Ukraine is not the way to support the people of Ukraine. What, what do you think? Ukraine is is endlessly complicated in in many ways. It, it, it does, of course, the Russia's war in Ukraine, Putin's war in Ukraine, really. And again, just like the United States, I don't think we should blame all Russians for a war that Putin and maybe a small number of his high-level cronies have, have launched. It shows us that, that of course, uh, 
Uh, there are other imperial and wannabe imperial powers in the world beyond the United States. And uh, while the, the causes of the war in Ukraine are complicated, and while I think it was a war that, that never need, needed to happen at multiple levels and was a war that, that the, the United States should have been seeking to prevent for, for many, many years, uh, I, I think that the, the primary problem now is that the U.S. government seems to continue to play a counterproductive role in bringing that war to an end. Um, that's, you know, I think what we should be firmly focused on, how we bring peace to Ukraine uh, as quickly as possible to end the death and, and suffering there. Plowing more weapons into Ukraine to uh, support the Ukrainian people while important to help them protect themselves, that's not what U.S. government officials have been primarily interested in. They have been very clear that they see this as a relatively inexpensive way to weaken Russia. Mm -hmm. The fact that that essentially Russia and the United States are now in a, a, a proxy war of just, what, three decades after the end of the, the Cold War is uh, really an awful indictment on a whole generation or two of, of U.S. policymakers who squandered the, the peace that came with the end of the Cold War that should have ensured long-term peace in Europe and, 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 a and Asia, but instead has brought us back to a, actually a, what appears to be a far more dangerous position than the one we faced in the original Cold War. We are now in something of a, a new global Cold War involving the United States and its allies and Russia and China, which are increasingly allied and, and closely connected to one another, and North Korea and a few other allies. Uh, all the while, we don't have the treaties or other uh, modes of, of diplomacy and negotiation that can protect us from what could be a direct military confrontation between the United States and its allies and Russia or China or both, which could of course spiral so easily into a nuclear war, um, a nuclear war that could take the lives of hundreds of millions, if not billions of people, an all out nuclear war between the United States and just Russia alone could basically make human existence on Earth impossible. Right. Could kill an estimated four to five billion people, the majority of people on Earth, and mm -hmm. could make all of human existence uh, impossible. Um, this is the threat facing us and, and a threat that, that very few people are aware of, and we are closer to that possibility than probably at any time since uh, the the most frightening moment of the, the Cold War, the, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, so this is what we urgently need to address while bringing the war in Ukraine to an end as quickly as possible. And that means the U.S. government must commit to supporting negotiations between Ukraine and Russia to bring the war to an end, um, rather than just plowing more weapons in, uh, in some really fanciful and uh, again, should be laughable, uh, but but there's nothing funny about it, uh, belief that, that there could be any military solution to this war. This war will be ended only through diplomacy and negotiation, uh, not by plowing more weapons in. The Ukraine is not going to defeat R Russia, and Russia has shown that it isn't going to defeat Ukraine. Uh, which again points to the the weakness of the Russian military, which has been one of the clear and obvious conclusions to be drawn from from this war. This vaunted Russian military machine that people are up in arms about um, has been unable to conquer much of of Ukraine at all, let alone march into Poland or other parts of Europe the way some people. Are suggesting, you know, that that Putin is some new Hitler. Um, this again is is fear mongering that is only benefiting the the weapons manufacturers, the the war profiteers, mm -hmm. and other parts of uh, what is increasingly an international 
military industrial complex. There are, of course, beneficiaries in places like Germany and uh, France, Britain, who where, where there are very wealthy and powerful weapons manufacturers who are also benefiting from these wars, just as the weapons manufacturers in, in Russia are benefiting from this war. This is what needs to end, and this is what U.S. government officials should be seeking to bring to an end as quickly as possible. Let's talk about Venezuela. They've recently had elections, and the U.S. powers that be, including the media, are saying that the elections were illegitimate, that the that Maduro didn't really win. What's going on there? It's very difficult to know what is going on there, but I think, again, the U.S. government really erred in so quickly concluding that Maduro didn't win. I think there are some troubling signs from, I mean, there are many troubling signs from the Maduro government going back many years in its anti-democratic behavior. Um, so it's it's very much unclear who won the elections. There are reasons to also uh, not trust and dispute the claims of, of the opposition. Uh, but the U.S. government, which of course has a long track record of being involved in coups and electoral meddling from Chile to Guatemala to uh, Bolivia and Honduras and beyond, um, the U.S. government really should shut up, um, really shouldn't say anything about elections or the internal politics of other countries in the Americas or anywhere on earth. Um, the, the track record is so horrific. And U.S. government, of course, by doing so, often just strengthens Maduro and makes it easier for anti-democratic leaders to point to the imperialist meddling of the United States, which is what the U.S. government has a track record of. Um, so I think it would be far more wise for uh, governments throughout the Americas to come together and ensure that the, the actual results of the election are, are understood um, and, and to, to ensure that the Maduro government releases uh, electoral tallies and other, other evidence um, and, and helps uh, the people of Venezuela overcome years of, of sanctions and, and the kind of catastrophic low-level warfare that the United States and a few of its allies have been, been waging that have tended to just prop up and strengthen Maduro while making life for the vast majority of Venezuelans horrific. It was so awful that they have uh, fled uh, Venezuela by the millions. In the interest of time, I think we're going to have to end it there. David Vine, it's been such a pleasure to have you. I recommend to our audience that uh, they check out your book, Base Nation, and also The United States of War. And how can people follow you online? I People can check out my website, davidvine.net. That's davidvine.net. I'm also part of a few different uh, groups, as I mentioned, a group that's trying to increasingly uh, encourage people to dismantle, to work together to find ways to dismantle the military industrial complex, this political economic structure that US taxpayers have helped create thanks to corrupt politicians and corrupt military and corporate elites. Um, you can go to dismantle the MIC dismantle the mic.org to learn more about that. It's a project that's just in its infancy. Um, I'm also part of a, a group called um, the Overseas Base Realignment and Closure Coalition that has uh, information about the really empire of, of US military bases around the world, um, overseasbases.net. Overseasbases.net is where you can find out more about uh, U.S. military bases abroad in efforts to close these unnecessary, wasteful, and very dangerous uh, con constellation of, of, of bases. Um, but you can find links to all of this at, at davidvine.net, uh, um, davidvine.net. And thank you, for, of course, for not just for having me, but, but for inviting me to talk about uh, ways that people can learn more about my work. Um, yeah, really a, a pleasure of to course. speak to you. Thank you for your scholarship and your dedication. And uh, we will uh, hopefully talk again soon. Fantastic. Thanks, Hart. Thank you.
Pleasure.